Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Tranquilli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A and mentorship at the end of this event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And none of what we do would be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, NZTE, and Microsoft for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions. Before we begin, during these unique times, we are curious about how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. We would like to start by taking two different polls to see how you are feeling. I'll launch this first poll now. How are you currently feeling? Are you feeling fearful, anxious? Are you surviving? Are you feeling optimistic? Please let us know. Thank you all, I'll share those results. It looks like we have a very optimistic group with us today, that's very exciting. And for our second poll, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales, or marketing? Is it scaling, pivoting, your team, or surviving? Please let us know. Thank you all for submitting. I'll share those results. It looks like finance is one of our top priorities that is keeping us up at night. I think we'll have some of those questions answered today. So without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest moderator, Kiran Jain, lecturer at University of Berkeley, Goldman School of Public Policy. Kiran advises venture-backed companies and startups and local governments on cutting edge legal and public policy she is the former Chief Resiliency Officer of the City of Oakland, and she had served as the founding attorney for Kiva. Kiran, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Maria. And I just want to thank everyone who's joining us today from around the world. Um, you know, anxiety levels are high in America um, as we await our um, accurate and uh, complete um, election results. So for those who are on this emotional roller coaster with us, um, I appreciate you taking the time. Out of, your, uh, out of your busy day. Um, first, I wanna introduce Jose Corona, uh, who's the Vice Chair of Programs and Partnerships for the Steph and Aisha Curry's Eat, Learn, Play Foundation. Previously, Jose served as the Director of Equity and Strategic Partnerships for the Mayor of Oakland and the Executive Director of Inner City Advisors, which provides capital to social entrepreneurs and closes the gender and racial wealth gap. Welcome, Jose. Next, I'd like to introduce Stacy Oliveras Castain. Um, she's a trustee of CalPERS, a pension fund. Um, I think actually maybe one of the world's largest pension funds. Um, it was a chief investment officer at Lendistry, a technology enabled small business lender and CDFI, a community development finance institution. She was senior advisor on impact investments for the state of California and served as managing director and CIO at the California Organized Investment Network. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you, Kiran. Next, I'd like to introduce Trevor Parham, the co-founder and general partner of Oakland Black Business Fund, a Black-led investment platform to provide capital and technical assistance to Black-owned businesses. The platform includes a $10 million relief fund focused on helping local Bay Area businesses impacted by COVID-19 and a $1 billion investment fund to support Black entrepreneurs across America. Last, we have Johnny Price, the Director of Fundraising at WeFunder, a public benefit corporation which helps startups and small businesses raise capital through investment crowdfunding. Before WeFunder, Johnny founded and led the Kiva US team, a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform for micro businesses in um, serving low to moderate income entrepreneurs. He also serves on the Federal Reserve Board's Community Advisory Council. Welcome, Johnny, and the panel. Um, I first want to start off um, 
with a, a group question and maybe, maybe starting in the order that I introduced you all. Uh, as we all know, there's many different avenues um, for fueling founder growth with technical human capital resources, um, as well as financial capital. Can you speak a little to what each of you are doing um, to help fuel company growth during these times? So you want me to start? Yes. Uh, thanks, Kieran, and uh, thanks also to the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center for having us here, and thank you all for participating from across the country. Um, as Kieran said, you know, we, we find ourselves in a little bit of a unprecedented times right now uh, where entrepreneurs like you are, are being forced to think about your business model differently and how you capitalize your, your venture or your enterprise or the idea that you're growing. Um, so depending on where you are uh, in your stage of business development, um, you know, you obviously are looking at capitalizing yourself uh, differently, and I think this is something that we'll talk about throughout the um, throughout the panel today. But what we're doing with the uh, Eat, Learn, Play Foundation, um, uh, we're, we're a very untraditional foundation. Uh, we're, we were started by Stephen Curry and Aisha Curry, uh, MBA All Star, but uh, and Aisha is an entrepreneur herself. Um, and we do grant making to support organizations, nonprofits that are providing support for um, making sure that all children have access to nutritious food, a quality education, and healthy spaces for young people to play. On the entrepreneur side though, however, um, we, we are looking, we do have a, um, a quasi investment platform that we're starting to look at really to help advance and really use our philanthropic dollars differently so that we can provide um, grant capital to entrepreneurs, for-profit entrepreneurs that are seeking to advance a social mission around education, around food, or around uh, healthy lifestyles. Uh, so we, we are using um, our philanthropic dollars uh, both to fund programs, but also to look at for-profit businesses that have a social mission behind them. So we're very focused on making sure that uh, the social mission uh, is advanced first, but obviously it has to be a profitable business for, for the mission to be sustainable. So uh, I'll pause there and I know we'll have more questions just to turn on to the next one. Thanks, Jose. Stacy. Thanks, Karan. Uh, so I've looked at it from the entire spectrum of capital. So when we think about how to finance our small businesses, it's everything from the initial seed capital. So maybe that's $500, maybe that's $1,000. There are certain nonprofits here in Los Angeles. We have Learn, L-U-R-N. And for example, they will fund street vendors. And then you take it all the way up to the institutional investors like CalPERS. We're about $420 billion in assets. And from there, I look at capital stacks that include very small business, very small dollar loans for small businesses. And so as a small business, as you think about this, sometimes it seems that there's not enough capital available and you don't know where to go. So community development financial institutions, which are uh, certified by the US Treasury Department are by their mission supposed to provide access to capital to communities who need it most. That includes small business loans. The SBA will also provide small business loans too. And then larger investors will come in along with foundations and partner up together. Foundations will provide loan loss reserves. The large investors will then securitize the loan instrument. And then you get some of the big asset owners who start to buy this up. And so it's all of us coming together to do this. Small businesses create 50% of our nation's jobs. So thank you to all the entrepreneurs out there listening today. Stacy, Trevor. Oh, you're still on mute, Trevor. How's that? Okay. So uh, at Oakland Black Business Fund, what we're focused on is, is really a continuum for Black businesses, you know, starting with those that are, um, you know, really still trying to, to get their bearings and get their footing as a business. Um, and at that level, we're providing business grants. Um, but then we go to the other end of the spectrum where you have businesses that have been in business for a while and are now prepared for much larger growth. And in between that, what we're focused on then is providing 
uh, technical assistance to help those businesses grow. And most of the technical assistance that we provide is provided through other black technical assistance providers who both have a familiarity with the journey of those entrepreneurs, um, but also have a vested interest in seeing the overall sort of health of the black economy improve. So by funding uh, technical assistance through other black providers, we're really looking at sort of a rising tides raises all boats type of model um, by keeping the dollars within the black community, number one, but then also strengthening longer term business to business relationships between the businesses that we fund and the providers that work with them. So overall, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do is kind of introduce businesses to the idea of what it looks like to, to grow and really trying to provide them with that initial grant funding to help them prepare for additional funding. And then once their business is in a position where um, they've both been able to get their financials in place, they've been able to optimize their business model, then they're in a position where they can receive larger growth funding. And that's where our investment arm comes in. Um, as well as our ability to connect them to other funders who might be interested in investing in them at that growth stage. That's great, thanks. Johnny. Yeah, so uh, on the WeFunder team, uh, we are an investment crowdfunding platform. So we help uh, startups and entrepreneurs raise capital, uh, not from institutional investors um, or accredited investors, i.e. rich people, um, but rather from ordinary people, um, their customers, their community members. We have 700,000 uh, investors on WeFunder that um, our entrepreneurs can get in front of and pitch their businesses to. And so we are, uh, as Kieran mentioned, in the, in the middle of uh, an election process here in America. Um, that is uh, obviously a, an illustration of a, a political democracy in action where um, individual people are casting their votes. And, and what WeFunder and, and crowdfunding is all about is enabling uh, ordinary people, millions of, of people to cast their votes financially. Um, and so uh, by doing that, uh, we are we are a public benefit corporation and a B Corp, but we fund a, um, and we believe that a more democratic approach to the allocation of capital can hopefully engineer uh, more equitable allocations of capital, i.e. More, more capital flowing to black founders, Latinx founders, women founders, founders in geographies that aren't, you know, the Bay Area or New York City. Uh, than is currently happening today. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, Stacy, building on uh, Johnny's point around democratizing access to capital, particularly for black and brown founders, um, could you speak a bit more to, um, to the lending um, piece of the capital stack and specifically including um, how the rural foundations can play like Jose in thinking about um, loan loss reserves and, and taking a potentially like a, a guarantor type position? Sure. So uh, black and brown founders face a lot of challenges with getting access to capital. And it's not just in terms of applying for the first loan or doing your first funding pitch. This actually follows the cycle of institutional racism to the point where the large investors that are buying up these loans will start to have questions about these founders. And so that's why this becomes so important in terms of who's part of the capital stack and how we do this. For example, having stacked a lot of capital with this, say we have a very large investment bank and there is uh, questions about who these founders are and, oh, are they so risky? I don't know. Some of that has to do with essentially institutional racism couched within those questions. They might have questions about the products or services or the particular markets that other founders wouldn't um, be questioned on. So this is where foundations can be critical. Um, sometimes large investment funds will want assurances in case something goes wrong with the investment. So they might ask for essentially an additional type of collateral in order to bring these loans together and then provide a lender with capital to lend out. So a nonprofit can come in and set aside, for example, $5 million for loan loss reserves. So letting that small business lender know, we will back up your loans. And that way, when you go to raise capital so that you have more money to lend, there is this assurance on the books. But let me be clear, these loans outperform. There is less risk. And I think that's not really understood. So when I'm going into the capital markets and I'm talking about the need for small business lending capital, I also frame this as how we get to alpha. 
this is how we generate additional return for institutional investors. It's how we build the economy. It's how we lift everybody up. So nonprofits can come in, provide loan loss reserves, which provide that additional insurance. Then um, lenders can also work with, for example, CDFI bond fund to have a guarantee come in on the back end. And then you can also bring in equity investors too. So there's actually more capital come in. All that comes together to increase the amount of capital available and decrease the cost of capital for entrepreneurs. That's so important right now because we need more and we need it cheaper and we need it quicker. Thank you, Stacey. Um, building on uh, your comments around diversity creating alpha um, in, in the markets. Trevor, I was hoping you could maybe speak to that and what you're seeing um, through your funds, um, as well as some of the alternative and creative structures you've been using or suggesting as both founder and funder. And you're muted again. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I think that's certainly um, a sort of applicable question given, given my background. I, I am also a founder of an organization called Oakstop, which is based here in Oakland. We're a co-working space that supports other entrepreneurs and artists of color. And we've, we've grown over the last seven years to about 10 times our original footprint. So I definitely have sort of seen the, the journey as a founder as well. Um, but I think that, you know, when we're, when we're looking at founders of color and, and sort of the support and, and the performance, a lot of what we see is that founders who have traditionally had uh, difficulty accessing capital have still grown their businesses despite. And in doing so, they've actually developed both more resilient business models, but they've also developed more resiliency as an entrepreneur themselves. Uh, because they've really learned how do I really, really fine tune that product market fit because there is no cushion to fall back on if your product doesn't sell and if your service doesn't catch on within the market. So when we look at investing in those founders, we actually feel a, a, a lower sense of risk and a greater sense of guarantee that they've been able to come three, four, five, six years growing a business, demonstrating that in their financials and their track record, but also doing so with less capital. And so now not only are they resilient, but they're also very clear on what they would do with capital because it would be truly an enhancement to their work and, and what they're doing versus um, you know, a crutch or something to just kind of carry them through until they can sort of figure out the next thing. Uh, it's typically the case that whatever their current thing is, is actually carrying them through. And now they're at a stage where they've seen the impact of their work both socially, but they've also seen specifically where they could inject that capital to effectively and strategically grow. Um, and so, you know, as an entrepreneur myself, it's, it's very much the same thing. You know, I'm, I've been in business now for close to seven years, haven't really taken any outside capital this entire time. Um, and as I said before, we started with 4,000 square feet and we're now close to 40,000 square feet. And that's all been done truly with just a product market fit. And we've been able to really get to a point where we understand exactly what our market is interested in, how to further sort of augment our product and service offerings such that it will catch on with our existing market as well as, as others. And now when we look at capital, we're, we're looking at it as, you know, how would this allow us to do things we haven't done before, which would really, you know, add to more growth. And so within our in, in investment approach, part of what we're trying to do is provide entrepreneurs with options and, and with flexibility with how we provide that capital. Uh, we're, we're using the phrase flexible capital, which is you know, something that other organizations have used in the past. And the, the idea behind flexible capital is ultimately allowing the entrepreneur to have the ability to choose and some flexibility with exactly how the sort of, um, the decision around debt versus equity. And I think that that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs face, um, obviously when they're facing um, you know, venture capital investment, but also if they're looking for capital of any kind. And sometimes the issue is that they're not able to be fully clear on whether or not they want to go with equity or debt when they start out. So we've been looking at um, convertible notes as one such method to be able to do that. And when you build in this idea of flexible capital, then you're also looking at 
how flexible and how dialectic is that sort of convertible note process and relationship? And what ability does the entrepreneur have to sort of dial that in and continue to modify it with their investors over the life of that note, such that when the, the note reaches a maturity date, investors and, and founders are both clear, number one, on whether or not they're, they're going to be able to go to that conversion uh, pathway, which would then, you know, allow them to essentially avoid repayment, but then also they're, they're selling a certain amount of equity, but also they're in a position where they're acquiring additional funding to really create that conversion moment or they're going to go a debt repayment route. But the trick for us is instead of being able to be in a position where they have to repay all that debt upon maturity or, or 12 months therein, we basically at that point redesigned what the debt repayment life cycle looks like. And they might have another three to five years to repay that debt such that it doesn't feel like a penalty if you haven't converted and haven't decided to raise additional um, equity capital from, from larger investors through say an A round. But really you've just decided that the healthiest thing for your business is to simply repay the debt because maybe you've grown to a point where you can do so, but also where you don't think that selling equity is going to be as, as affordable. And also you may not want those investors to be on your cap table and involved in your organization you know, for the long haul. And so that for us is a way to really facilitate that growth in a different, in a different fashion where some entrepreneurs simply aren't in a position where they should be forced to sell their business and sell their sort of long-term growth simply because they're interested in capital at a strategic point that would allow them to repay capital and repay investment. That's a great point, Trevor. Um, how, how do you mentor or guide entrepreneurs through those different paths, right? Because there's a certain level of confidence and assurance you have kind of looking forward, right? Of Should I go the convertible route? Should I go the straight debt repayment? Yeah, and you know, I think that the, the, the idea is ultimately understanding, it, it's two things. Number one, if we're gonna look at debt repayment, how can you actually leverage this debt to truly grow the business and, and grow your revenues to a place where you're going to be able to sustainably repay that debt over what term? And, and, and possibly some of the conversation throughout the life of the note is also getting clear on what is that horizon for the debt repayment? Is it is it three years, is it five years, and how can we work with those investors to make them comfortable with that horizon? Um, but it ultimately comes down to this idea of, can, can you repay it in a short amount of time? And is, it, it, is the repayment worth paying that debt off, moving forward, and then not being in a position where you're going to continue to, to pay that dividend to those investors you know, year over year, and also have them you know, potentially in a voting position in your company, which may not necessarily be your interest. Um, on the equity side of it, it's looking at, do you need more of a runway to get to a point where you're really going to be a high growth company? And if so, what are the trade-offs and what is that balance? And would you want, say, another five to 10 years um, to continue to grow the business without repaying that initial capital such that then you would hit that you know major sort of uh, inflection point or that major sort of scale point where maybe at that point you do look like you have that hockey stick growth. And then at that point, um, you know, repaying your investors, number one, works for them, makes them happy. But also the bigger piece there is, is there a moment for a, a larger round of funding that you can convince investors of will exhibit that growth? And if so, then it, it, it could be great for everyone. But the idea is that sometimes a business isn't in that position, number one, to to recognize that within, within both their business, but also within themselves and their own sort of path as an entrepreneur. Um, but then also sometimes they just, they need to be able to get to that point where they're clear that that's actually gonna happen. And it can't always be evident, you know, at that point that they're looking for that capital. I appreciate that. Jose, I'm gonna turn to you right now, actually, because I think this could build on some of the work that you did with, with ICA. Um, um, speaking to, you know, how you would advise founders to navigate these capital choices, um, as well as, you know, economic resiliency. It's a term you and I have spoken about quite a bit. What does that mean um, as a founder to seller? Sorry, what was the last part? There was a lot of background noise. Oh, uh, sorry. The um, economic resilience. What does it mean for founders of color? Yeah, I, and I, I mean, I just want to echo a lot of the things that Trevor mentioned. Um, I think, um, 
unfortunately, you know, entrepreneurs of color have these extra hurdles and burdens that they need to prove in, as they're raising money that other, um, that was just white entrepreneurs don't face. So, so I just want to thank Trevor for all the work that, that he's doing um, for entrepreneurs of color in, in, our, in our city. Um, for me, when, when I think about um, economic resiliency, for me, it means how are you going to take care of yourself and your family? Uh, when I was with ICA Fund Good Jobs, uh, you know, we were in, we were in funding and providing assistance to entrepreneurs. You know, not a lot of tech entrepreneurs. So not to say that we didn't like tech entrepreneurs. Uh, it just seemed like our profile and the businesses that we supported were a lot of food production, manufacturing companies, um, health-related companies, education-related companies, and the entrepreneurs and the profile of entrepreneurs that we saw were people that were starting the business, not because they wanted to scale for scale's sake, but they wanted to grow a business so they can provide a, a, a living and have dignity and have agency for their lives and their families. So when, when I talk about economic resiliency and what it means for me, it's the ability to be able to support yourself and your family and those around you and your community with dignity and giving people agency. So uh, when we talked to entrepreneurs, you know, one of the first questions that we asked them was, you know, why do you want to start a business? Uh, and it wasn't because we didn't believe in them or we were questioning their idea. It was just, we wanted to understand their values. And for us, the values were around supporting the community. It happened to be that a lot of the entrepreneurs that we helped became super successful. They created, they went from two people to creating, you know, 3000 jobs in the country from, going from zero in revenue to, you know, I think the biggest one, um, you know, uh, now has about 35,000 employees. A couple that blue other, bottle, Jose? Or... Yeah. Uh, a couple other ones got acquired by, by different private equity firms. You know, Blue Bottle got acquired by Nestle. So the, the success is there, but it all started kind of with the values vision. So uh, I think for me, it was really... Uh, for us, uh, when I was with ICA, uh, it was important to really find funders that were also aligned with your values and your mission, whether they were philanthropic funders, whether they were debt, or whether they were private equity. Um, we always really wanted them for them to be a values match, because if you have some social values and then you get paired up with a very capitalist private equity VC firm, the values alignment is just not going to be there and one of you is going to lose. Um, you're either not going to get the capital or your business is, uh, is going to be transformed if you inject the wrong kind of capital into your business. It's going to change the your model. It's going to change your business. It's going to change your values. So it's, it's just something to be a really understanding. But again, at the end, for, from where, where I sit and where, you know, how I live my life has been around this economic resiliency model, which is supporting yourself, your family, your community. So entrepreneurs that are seeking to advance that and provide more wealth and more uh, economic uh, security for themselves and, and community is something that, that was important to us. Thank you, Jose. And just bringing it back to the foundation where you're at today, um, loan loss reserves came up earlier. I'm just curious, I know the Kresge Foundation has done that. Are there any other foundations out there that you know that provide entrepreneurs that type of support? Yeah, there, there's a lot. I mean, there's the there's a certain foundation does a lot of loan loss reserve there in New York. Uh, even community foundations have started to do that. You know, here in the Bay Area where we are, the San Francisco Foundation, uh, SH Cal Foundation, YNH Soda Foundation. There's so many philanthropic partners out there that are able to partner, as Stacy was saying, with a CDFI or with a lender and provide their philanthropic capital as a backstop to guarantee. Uh, the repayment of, of the actual loan. So um, that does exist. Um, and, and I think it's just, it's, you know, all of you in, in this call are entrepreneurs. So it's just kind of doing the, the hustle and the homework and finding uh, who's out there and building the networks and getting to know people to connect you to the right people that then you can make the pitch. Uh, because if we know that whether, whatever entrepreneur you are, you could be white, you could be Black, you can be black, whatever it is, you all have the same hustle and finding the right person that will help you navigate the, the real vast ecosystem of capital out there. 
Thanks, Jose. And we can provide some of those resources after this call. Um, Johnny, moving to moving to crowdfunding um, and equity, um, can you tell us more about your model and how it helps early stage companies? Um, and what are some of the you know, positives and challenges it might present? Yeah, so we use uh, an exemption called regulation crowdfunding to help startups raise capital. So most startups in America use what's called regulation D, which is where they are raising from accredited investors, i.e. millionaires and billionaires and institutions, and uh, they are privately soliciting investors. Um, regulation crowdfunding was part of the 2012 Jobs Act um, signed into law by President Obama, and it was brought up by the SEC in May 2016. So it's a relatively new approach. Oh, I think we just got a frozen screen from Nashville. So Johnny, we'll come back to you. Um, but um, to finish his thought, this is a, a, a newish. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I think it's a bad Wi-Fi connection on my end. Um, you're not in Chattanooga, saying, where they have gigabit. You're in you're in Nashville. Yeah. What I was saying was that um, with regulation crowdfunding, you can do two um, cool things as a founder. Firstly, uh, you can raise from unaccredited investors as well as accredited investors. And then secondly, you can publicly promote the offering on Facebook, uh, in an email blast to your customers, you can uh, get in the press, et cetera. Um, and so you can now get your uh, investment opportunity in front of everyone, and now everyone can invest. Um, and so uh, in those two ways, we can oftentimes make it easier for startup founders uh, to raise capital. Um, and then the other big benefit is that if your customers um, become owners in your company, uh, and I say owners, the majority of the capital we do is equity. You can also raise debt capital on WeFunder. But if your customers and your community members become investors in you, they're going to spend more money with you. They're going to be more passionate brand ambassadors for your business. Uh, and so there can then be you know, positive effects, revenue, but others as well. Like, for example, let's say you're hiring for a software engineer. Uh, maybe you can get your crowd of WeFunder investors to promote that job description on their LinkedIn page. Um, so the idea is that hopefully having an army of investors and champions can do good things for your best business, as well as making it easier for you to, to raise some money. And then on the on the kind of downsides, I think maybe highlight a couple of things. Firstly, it is a transparent process. So you, you are publicly disclosing your financials. Some founders are not comfortable with that. If, if that um, isn't kind of what you want to do, then crowdfunding is not a good approach. Um, and then secondly, it is work, right? It's definitely not the case that you launch a campaign on WeFunder and watch a million dollars roll in the next day without doing anything. Um, you know, you got to send the emails, you got to have the meetings, the phone calls, you got to, you know, do the social media, put together the fundraising plan, put together a great um, campaign page, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I like to think that it's an easier way to raise money than if you're relying on meeting with angel investors and, and trying to, you know, you can only raise through private solicitation of rich people. Um, so I think this approach, you can do that as well, but it gives you more options, um, but it's definitely not uh, easy. It's it's really easy to, to raise uh, a million dollars. So I always like to try and set clear expectations about the work that's entailed, especially if you want to raise a lot of money on a platform. So what stage companies do you typically see on the WeFunder platform? Yeah, we have a wide range of companies that we invest in, both in terms of sector. Um, we're all across the economy. So we do a lot of tech startups, but we also do a lot of um, coffee shops and not too far from you, Kieran. And um, I don't know if you know this, but we funded uh, Red Bay uh, Coffee, which is a really cool independent uh, coffee shop in, in Oakland. Yeah. Um, so all across the economy in terms of sector and also stage. So we are doing $50,000, you know, kind of quasi friends, small friends and family rounds in, you know, pre-launch uh, businesses all the way through to, you know, $5 million investments into a brewery like Modern Times in San Diego uh, that had $30 million of annual revenue uh, the year before they launched the WeFunder campaign. So, you know, obviously for them, it actually was very easy <laughs> to fundraise. Uh, they raised uh, a mi the million dollars, the first million dollars in about a day on WeFunder um, by sending like one email to their customer base. Um, so it can be easy if you have a huge audience, um, but especially for most earlier stage companies, it will take work. But in terms of sector and stage, we're pretty agnostic. 
Thank you. Trevor, I want to come back to you and um, drill down on some of the comments that you had made earlier around safe um, and kind of drawing out the differences, right, between a convertible note and other forms of investment um, for equity. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we look at convertible notes, um, oftentimes the idea of a safe investment comes up and that, that stands for a simple agreement for future equity. And so the, the difference there, what, what's similar between the two is that uh, the business can receive investment through either one of those um, mechanisms. However, um, with a safe investment, the focus is on future equity and, and that is the focus. With a convertible note and convertible debt, the idea is that you could be um, converting towards, you, you could be doing debt or you could be doing equity. And I think that the, the idea overall is that for some companies, they just may not want equity investment. They, they just might not want that at all. Um, and so I think that's what is, is, is good about a convertible note is that you have that ability to choose. And there's a number of different reasons that you might not want equity. For other companies, you know, equity is, is the idea from the inset and from the outset in terms of how they've developed their company. They want to build something that they can sell off to investors. And so, so therefore, you know, having a safe investment makes a lot of sense that you don't exactly know what the valuation of the company is going to be yet. And you don't want to be in a position where you essentially pigeonhole yourself and say, oh, well, we don't know where we're going. So, you know, valuation ends up being a tenth of what it could be. Um, but you're also not in a position where you're selling the investors on this wild dream of valuation that doesn't really make any sense at that point, such that they're going to be hesitant to invest. And so it's a way to allow both founder and funder to sort of inch forward into the relationship without having full clarity at that moment. Um, part of also what the investor has as a bit of a safety for them is that they also have a potential cap on the valuation of the company so that, you know, whatever they put in, um, if the company then later on says, okay, now our valuation is a thousand times what we thought it was going to be, their investment isn't essentially sort of diluted or brought down to such a minority that it's, you know, not worth them sort of taking that risk at that early stage. So, you know, when I, when I zoom out though, and I look at those things within a social concept context, sometimes uh, entrepreneurs of color may not want to be selling their business because they're doing that business because it has a specific sort of social aim or social um, focus and mission that doesn't necessarily want to have a whole lot of people loaded into it that are then either going to be in a position where they're voting and making decisions that are potentially steering that company away from the social mission, number one, or it could be in a situation where they simply want to say that their company is owned by certain types of people. Um, and I can see that an entrepreneur of color may be in a position where they are okay taking debt from an institution and saying, okay, well, we took a loan and we're paying back that loan versus saying, we have this investor who doesn't necessarily align with our values and now they own our company for the long term. Um, obviously, there are scenarios in which you could do an equity buyback arrangement such that you've taken on that equity and now you can, you know, over time sort of buy that investor out. But I think that that's, that's ultimately in my mind sort of the distinction between safe and convertible is are you clear that you want investors in your business over the long term? Or do you simply need capital in the short term and also need to buy yourself time to figure out exactly how you're going to pay that capital back and or have those investors you know, not in your company? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's like, kind of building that relationship instead of rushing to the altar. Um, I love that distinction. Johnny, for WeFunder, um, how does that look for, for your entrepreneurs? And, and what's the cost of using the platform also? Yeah, so the cost of using WeFunder, um, we charge 7.5% of the amount that you raise. Um, so if you raise a million dollars on WeFunder, we keep 75K and send you 925K. That's the only thing you ever pay us. We don't charge you any fixed fees to launch a campaign or anything like that. Um, if you don't reach your minimum goal, uh, you don't actually pay us anything. Um, so our interests are quite aligned there. Um, you would set a minimum and a maximum goal. So actually on Monday, it's very topical, uh, this panel, because on Monday, the SEC just approved an increase in the amount that a founder can raise through regulation crowdfunding each year. 
Uh, it was 1.07 million, now it's 5 million. Um, so uh, that would be your maximum. Uh, maybe your maximum is less, um, let's say it's 250K, but wherever it is, um, that's your max. And then you set a minimum. So let's say your max is a million, maybe your minimum is 250K. And then as long as you raise more than 250K, we take 7.5% of that and send you the balance. If you miss the minimum goal, then the money goes back to the investors. You don't get anything. We also don't get any revenue. And it's been a waste of everyone's time. So we like to try to set realistic expectations at the outset of the process for every founder we work with. And, um, you know, we'll obviously try to try to guide you both on whether this is a good um, route for you to go down. And if it is, um, and we, we agreed to launch a campaign together, we're obviously going to dedicate our resources to try and help you uh, succeed. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I know we're getting up to time in, in the Q&A section, but before we transition to that, I want to start with, with Stacey and, and just, um, you know, this has been a really rich, robust discussion. I feel like I could talk to you all for hours. Um, what's one key takeaway you want to share with the group? And I'll start with Stacey. You know, the value of the, the product and service that you're creating and, and what you bring to the table as an entrepreneur. And I say that because it requires incredible confidence and tenacity to get through this capital raising process and use that as you start to look for alternative sources of funding. So looking up CDFIs in your community, looking at foundations in your community, um, and then going online to some of the FinTech lenders that are also CDFIs. Um, so just don't settle on the first no, and you're probably persevering since you're an entrepreneur, you know, and don't, don't decline yourself, keep going. I love that. Thank you, Stacy. Jose. Uh, ditto to what Stacy said, and I will add that um, what I said earlier, which is really understand the type of funder that you're looking for, um, and understand what 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 you're going to use the capital for. I think you you all have a great idea. I am sure uh, you're entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's again an idea right now or a side hustle, or you're generating revenue. You all have an idea of why you want to create this business, but but my biggest uh, uh, advice is, is around understanding the type of funder and investor that you're looking for, and to be, really understand your values and their values, uh, and so that you find alignment in that, because not not all capital is good capital. I love that leading with values here here, um, Trevor. Yeah, to, uh, to piggyback on, on Jose's comments, um, I, I'd say that the main thing is that funding is not validation, right? Like you, you create the validation by creating your product and having your customers and your consumers purchase that product. That's, that's essentially where a lot of the validation is. Um, you could also argue that validation is, is doing something that really does truly um, you know, follow your mission and your vision for your community. Um, from there, funding is, is a relationship. You are forming a relationship with an actual person or entity, not the, the money that they provide. So you do have to be very clear on what it means to bring those people into your world. And you know, think about it like any other relationship. Would you be so quick to just jump into it simply because you thought that that's what you needed? Um, or would you bring that relationship into your life at a point that you feel really confident about what you're doing in your own life and your journey, such that then bringing that relationship to the, to the fold would only bolster what you're doing. So, you know, I think that that's been my, my personal journey, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, as I said before, you know, I, I got to the point of about five or six years where I hadn't really brought on any major outside capital and only wanted to do so at the point that I was looking to go to three or four more locations. And at that point, really wanted to just broaden what we were doing and bring other people into it because I saw the business as becoming more of a movement than just my business. And at that point, I wanted other people to be involved in that movement. So the investors that I would be looking for in that way would be mission aligned investors who really believed in what that movement was about. And by having a track record and an opportunity to grow and expand, we could then really demonstrate to them how that movement would look. So 
So again, that's that's my main takeaway is, is funding is not validation. It's it's your hard work as an entrepreneur that is. Love that too, because it sometimes gets confused, especially here in Silicon Valley. Um, Johnny. Yeah, um, just to build really on what Trevor said, I think I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and they're looking at raising capital and they really want to raise the capital. Um, and uh, oftentimes I encourage them to try to focus on building the product uh, and improving the product and finding customers and delighting customers before you raise capital. And obviously it's not always that easy if you're building a hardware company or a biotech company, you know, as many, it's, it, you're, you need capital to get to that point. Um, but I think much, much more often than not, and maybe more than you might think, uh, you can go further and do more uh, to roll out a product and MVP, iterate on that, get, get validation from customers um, without capital or on less capital than you might otherwise think. So I love that Lean Startup book by Eric Ries. And um, we've kind of lived that at WeFunder. I lived that when I was at Kiva. Um, and I always encourage entrepreneurs to you know, try to bootstrap as much as you possible. Um, you know, if you can keep growing without giving up equity in your company, without having to pay back lenders with an interest rate, that's, uh, you know, that's better. Um, doesn't always work. But, and then if you are raising capital, um, definitely look at uh, investment crowdfunding. I think every entrepreneur, especially B2C, but B2B companies too, um, it's, it's a relatively new model. Um, you know, it's, it's still um, a pretty small percentage of, of capital, but it's, it's growing very, very quickly now, especially with these recent SEC changes. Um, and so I think it's at least worth you uh, taking a look at and uh, considering as one of the many options available to you. Thanks, Johnny. Um, we're going to open it up now to um, the entire audience. And I'll, I'll start with one question. And then, Maria, if you have other um, questions you want to share from the audience, um, can you all share your thoughts um, on how best to reach out to and establish a relationship with a funder, whether it be in philanthropy, government, you know, seed funder? Um, I'll start with that question. I look at you, Trevor. Um, so in terms of where you sort of start your, your funding relationship, um, yeah, I mean, I think that again, it, it really comes down to the specific nature of that relationship. And it could be a philanthropist who believes in, in what you're doing and, and is able to provide you essentially some sort of grant funding that allows you to get that going and off the ground. And potentially then there's opportunities to be part of their um, portfolio and that that actually provides you with even more visibility um, in the social impact space, um, which could be a great opportunity. Um, a seed investor also, if they are also willing to be a mentor and connect you to other resources, I think that that's also, you know, a great opportunity. And then I think that one thing that we we see a lot within um, startup overall, and, and this is talked about a lot with regards to sort of the, the equity lens, is the idea of friends and family, right? And I don't have the statistics offhand right now, but in general, um, <clears throat> you know, entrepreneurs of color are far less likely to get uh, significant amounts of friends and family capital when starting their businesses. And those who are able to get that friends and family capital are getting it um, from friends and family who believe in not only what they're doing business-wise, but just believe in who they are. They've seen them go through, you know, academic spaces. They've seen them in personal spaces and they just say, Hey, I really believe in you. And I want to ensure that you're you know, going to continue to grow as an individual. And so I think that's also a great option if your community has that. Um, but again, it's not something to be concerned about or feel bad about if, if you don't have that. And so, you know, ultimately, I think the, the best place to go is with somebody who who knows you and who wants to see you be successful and isn't looking at a return. There's someone who is really just saying, I want to get you started. And my return is seeing that you will go far and, and hopefully continue to grow. I love that framing. Um, advice to founders. Um, Jose, what are, and I'll ask to each of you, but starting with Jose, what are some of the pitfalls you would advise um, founders to, to avoid? Um, 
Man, that's probably a, a question better asked for Trevor since he's the entrepreneur on the panel. Um, <laughs> You've advised many. Uh, yeah, I, I think for, for us, um, it's um, it's really understanding the business model. I think I think a lot of people have that we've seen. You know, and I, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, we helped a lot of retail manufacturing companies in, in our in my day at ICA, and there's a lot of people that wanted to start cafes and but had never worked in the service industry. Uh, they just wanted to do it for the brand, for the coolness. I think it was, you know, starting a cafe or a restaurant was romanticized. Uh, so they, they really didn't understand the, the actual business. You know, we asked them even questions like, have you actually worked at a restaurant? Have you ever been a server? Or have you ever run a cafe? And no, no, no. Um, so I think a big pitfall was not understanding the industry that you're trying to go into. Um, I think often it gets romanticized maybe for the potential and the idea of, of success and, and, and money and revenue rather than really understanding not only the sector, but also within the sector, you know, what, what problem are you trying to solve at the end of the day, whether it's financial or whether it's social impact, uh, understanding, you know, what are you trying to solve in the world? Um, and then how is your model and how is your product going to actually solve that? So being very clear about that was something that we spent a lot of time at ICA almost in a way dissuading people not to start a business uh, because it, we found that um, they, it was just a matter of time that they were going to start and then fail really fast. Um, and I think it was for us, it was better advice to really add, be candid and ask those hard questions than to just say yes, just because we like you as a person. I think that's a really important insight as well. Sometimes just don't do anything until, until you're ready to. Um, Johnny. Yeah, um, in terms of pitfalls on the, on the WeFunder side, um, I think, uh, you know, going back to what I said earlier, um, kind of just coming into it with the expectation that it's going to be easy. So I think just, you know, knowing uh, it's going to be hard work. Um, and especially, I think it was maybe Jose or Trevor, uh, you know, it, it is hard. If, if, you, if your network is less affluent than, you know, the, the kind of friends and family that you can bring in through WeFunder, is also it's going to be harder for you to um, tap into that pool of capital, just as it is if you're trying to raise capital outside of um, an investment crowdfunding platform. So, so then it might be that you need to kind of work harder and, and hustle harder. Um, a really awesome success story for us was uh, Max uh, Tukman from Caribou. Um, she was the first Latina founder to raise a million on WeFunder uh, for her app. It's an amazing app. Uh, it, it kind of helps um, young kids have conversations like with their grandparents. I use it with my um, kids, uh, with my mom and dad in the UK. It's amazing. Uh, but uh, she just hustled really, really hard um, and made it happen. So I think uh, that's that's the main um, kind of uh, concern for me. And there was a great question in the Q&A around traction. And, and obviously, yeah, you know, um, kind of investors are going to are gonna want to see traction. So I, I think sometimes you might you might be trying to raise capital too early or you might be trying to raise too much capital for the stage you're at or you might be trying to raise capital on a valuation that isn't really merited or justified by uh, the metrics you have so making sure um you're trying to raise an appropriate amount of capital at the right time on the right terms um is super important as well as then putting in putting in the work to make it happen Thanks. You took my, my last question, but I want to have Stacy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question around traction, um, how important it is and to determine the success of landing investments. Um, you know, as Johnny alluded to, there can be a catch 22, depending on what point you're, you're bringing it in, um, as well as access. Um, so how important is traction in determining the success of investing? I think it's important to have traction early on before you're raising capital. And I think Trevor and Jose and Johnny have also talked to, about this too. Um, it proves that the market is there. It proves that the pro product or service is viable. Um, it also shows, which is very important, that you know your niche, right? You know 
in which space you can be successful, you're demonstrating that expertise, you've penetrated that market to some degree, and you're understanding what the growth potential is. And that's really important because the person you're talking to like on the lending side and the investing side, most likely is not an expert in that area. Maybe if you're lucky, they know that particular ge geography, maybe they know the demographic, but they might not know that specific area. So if you're able to gain traction, that shows without a doubt that you know your area very, very well and you have a roadmap to success. That's great. And on that note, I want to hand it back to Maria. Um, thank you, panelists. This was a wonderful and invigorating conversation. Um, I appreciate you giving me something to, um, to focus on other than uh, social media and the news right now. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for taking the time to speak to our community, to share your insights, and to set such a great overview from all of us here. Thank you so much. Uh, we would love to hear from you. For those of you that are listening in, please fill out the survey that ISIS has, our webinar host has dropped in the chat. All of our panelists here would love to know what you learned during the session and what additional topics you might want to speak about. And again, for all of you still with us today, join us for our next events coming up in the next few weeks, Tuesday, November 10th, Unlocking Capital Through Relationships with Melanie Velasquez and Thursday, November 12th, Unstoppable Confidence to Sell, Pitch, and Present Virtually with Casey Carpenter. We would love to hear from you. So again, please take a look at our survey, fill that out, let us know what you're thinking and feeling. And panelists, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. This has been an invigorating and highly informative discussion. We hope all of you have a great day. Thank you from NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. <laughs>